Welcome to the Open to Hope show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley. Uh, my daughter, Heidi Horsley, and co-host is traveling today, so wasn't be able to be on the show. But I've got a fabulous co-host, Michelle Neff Hernandez. Hi, Michelle. Hey, Gloria. It's wonderful to be here. How are you doing? Great. It's great to have you as a co-host. I've admired Michelle for so many years. She started Soaring Spirits. It used to be a foundation, but now it's international because she's gone all over the place. Tell everybody a little bit about Soaring Spirits before we introduce our friend Bob Bauer. Will do. Well, first I want to say the feeling is mutual. I am great admiration for the work that you and uh, Heidi have been doing through Open to Hope. Uh, Soaring Spirits International is a peer-based organization that provides peer support programming for widowed men and women. And it began with my own experience when my 39-year-old husband was killed in an accident. Um, I really, really wanted to find other widowed people, and I had no idea how to do that. And so I started looking for them, and then I started collecting them, and then uh, we created an organization together. And here we are 10 years later, uh, having served over 3 million widowed people since our inception. And you have also, just tell them quickly about some of the fun things you have, like camp, uh, you we know. Your a, our signature program is called Camp Widow. It is a weekend long event, which is a mix between a conference and a retreat and a social experience. Uh, we do three of those a year, one in San Diego, one in Tampa, and one in Toronto. And then we have a, a huge number of online programs, including our Widowed Village, which is a 24-7 chat room available as well as forums and blogs it's basically a way to connect no matter where you are as long as you have an internet connection and she also has some great conferences yeah so we've had a great we have a great community that we love sharing with other widowed people well and now to our guest dr bob bowers and bob is a good friend he is a fabulous presenter uh he's presented at compassionate friends for years and he is so fantastic and i was excited to hear he has another book he has other books you can tell us about but uh he's come out with a book on widowhood he's a consultant but he's kind of the one that organized it because um, what made you choose to do your dissertation on widowhood um i I'd been teaching a course on death for a number of years and um, and knew some widowed people and did some work with widowed people when I was in uh, Nashville um, doing doing my uh, graduate work. And so um, the hospice organization helped me um, gather a bunch of folks and I interviewed more than 100 widowed people and out of those, 59 of them gave me permission to also contact their adult children and ask them what their perceptions were of their their mother's bereavement process. And uh, what I found was, and I'm sure the people who have adult children know, is that guess what? Adult children don't know much about what their widowed mothers are going through. And uh, I wish I had more um, um, men in my study, but um, I focused on the 59 women. And so I learned a lot and I interviewed them and asked them a number of questions. But that's the upshot of it is that, of course, you know, your adult child can't know everything because, you know, you're not. You, you haven't lost your partner and you um, go home each night to maybe you know, have your own spouse and so on. So um, so that started me going. And then I've been the consultant for the, a number of years here in Seattle. The organization is called Widows Information and Consultation Service. And so in putting together the book, uh, uh, starting a few years ago, um, we have five co-authors, one of whom is my sister, Lori. And uh, I came across Soaring Spirits. and said, oh, that's an interesting organization. And so we put their website in our book because um, it such, looks like such a wonderful organization. So it's fun, glad to finally meet you, Michelle. This is what a, a woman said in one of the widow groups I was in. She raised her hand and said, you know, when you're married to this person who knows you better than any of the world, you're number one. And then one day, you're not number one in anyone's life anymore. And I give that quote to my students when I teach the death course. And, you know, I think, I hope it really hits them is that suddenly, and, you know, Michelle, you know this, your whole life changes. Yeah. It's interesting because I liken it to, you know, if you got a flat tire on the freeway, who would be the person you would call and who would stop yeah. whatever they were doing to come and get you? And it's not that yeah. you don't have other people to call necessarily, but there's not that one person who has made an agreement with you that that's their job. If you're stranded somewhere, they're the one who's going to come and help you, whatever that yeah. situation is. What, what we did, actually, we came up with 49 suggestions in terms of what helps and then we have them about 15 suggestions on what doesn't help but one is of course what what we all know is validation because 
And I remember my aunt Marilyn, when, and when her husband died, she knew that I'd already done my dissertation and I knew some things about widowhood. But what she always said to me was, I'm, by the way, I'm Bobby in the family. She said, Bobby, and she said this several times over the years, don't forget, when you are um, married, you are in this world. And as soon as you are widowed, you are in totally a different world. And you have all these reactions coming with you that are so strange and bizarre. And, and so part of the beginning part of the book is just listing a whole lot of brief reactions and the kind of things that people say, you know, about guilt and anger and shame and embarrassment and, and, you know, fatigue and all these things that go on. So that's a lot of what the beginning part of the book is. The thing about the reactions too, is that they're unexpected. So you, there's no way for you to imagine how that would feel until you're actually living it. But, you know, you, many people have said, well, I just don't understand why would people would feel shame or embarrassed? It doesn't make sense to them. And yet, you know, these kind of reactions can be so normal, especially, but at the same time, you're thinking, why do I feel this way? It's, it's such a tornado of feelings that on the one hand, don't make any sense. And on the other hand, make total sense to you in the moment, uh, you know, and so it's, it's just an experience that upends your life in every regard. Uh, Michelle, you're right. That word torna tornado is great because it just comes at you and then in unexpected ways. And, and it's one of those things that, you know, continues for weeks and months and, and some of those, you know, years. And of course, you know, people who are not in grief, they don't get it. They like, well, you know, it's, it's been eight months. It's been, you know, two, two and a half years. Like what's, what's going on here. And mm -hmm. so just, and, and again, a great thing about your organization and, and also Gloria, you and Heidi and Heather, you know, putting together open to hope and how people can just click on, on, you know, any of these articles and videos and so on that, and to be able to chat 24 hours uh, with, with people who are going through some of what you're going through is such powerful stuff. And, you know, it, um, you can imagine years ago that people were just kind of hanging out there. They, they didn't know what to do. And so, so there's yeah. hope out there and you certainly give it. Yeah, all the connection and how to worry effectively. That's interesting. How do you worry effectively? Yeah. I, uh, a few years ago, I was working with, um, uh, some of you know, the name Darcy Sims and, uh, we were working on a book and, and, uh, I, 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 chose one little section on worry and I brought it back to her and said, so uh, what, what do you think about what we'll put this in the book? And she goes, and she pointed to me and said, you should do a workshop on worry. <laughs> so I looked up some of the research and found, and so here's, and we, so we put, put it in the book and, uh, and it goes like this, three steps involved in worrying effectively because what do people say to you? Oh, don't worry. Oh, it'll be okay. I'm sure Michelle, you got this. It, you know, I know you're worried about, you know, what's going on here, but you know, here, here's what you can do. So three steps. Step one is that you write down your worries. And I'm sure you guys knew this was coming. But what we know in psychology, and I tell my students over and over is that, you know, when we have something in our head, it just stays there and it goes around and around and around. You need to get it down on paper. You need to see it in front of you. I worry about this and this and this. And so you get them all down, no matter how unrealistic, how silly they are, you put them down. Then second is you find a place to worry. And the psychologists call this partitioning. That is, you find a place in your house, in your home, that this is where is going to be your worry location. It could be you know, standing next to your closet. It could be out on your front porch. It could be, um, you know, in a corner of your kitchen. It could be sitting on your bed, but it can't be a place where you, where you normally do things a lot, right? So, and because guess what our brain does? Our brain plays a cruel trick on us. And what's the trick? As soon as our head hits that pillow, we start worrying right at the time when we can't do anything about it, right? You know, and we're thinking, oh, and so when I, I tell my, students and mentioned in the book is you talk back to your brain and you say, listen, brain, I know I'm worrying about these things, but I'm going to work on it tomorrow because yeah. I can't do anything about it now. And so you find this place. And so here you are at work and you start worrying about things and you say, okay, I can't worry about it now. But when I get home tonight, I'm going to stand next to, you know, the, or, or sit next to the dining room table, an area that I don't normally sit and I'm going to sit there and that's where I'm going to do my worry. And it may sound silly, but what you're doing is narrowing that you know, that, that generalization where you worry everywhere in your car and, you know, and at a party or whatever. It's like, no, nope, I can worry about this later. 
And the you third know, step is, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say that's interesting because, you know, in the grieving process, uh, I know Eric Kippel, Heidi and I wrote a book with him. He's a quarterback called Real Men Do Cry. This big guy would go down in the basement and light a candle and think about his son at night. He had a special time where he did that. And it's the same kind of thing. He compartmentalized. Yes, exactly. This is where I'm going to do it. And it's not... It's not saying don't do it. It's saying, yes, I am going to do it, but here's right. how I'm going to do it and try to do it in a way. And of course, you know, you are going to worry at times. He is going to think about his son and feel sad at other times, but this can become a focus for you. Okay, so first step, write down your worry. Second step, find a place to worry. Third step, then go through your worries one by one and ask yourself, you know, that um, serenity prayer question, which is, which ones do I have some control over? Now, Take a look at number one. Do I have control over this? Meaning, is there someone I can talk to? Someone I need to text? Something I need to do? A phone call I need to make so I can do something about this? Because, you know, especially when your spouse dies, you got all these issues swirling around. What's going to happen to me and so on. And, and then you look at another one and, and you realize, you know, I can't do anything about this right now. And then the question becomes, and this is the harder part, is can I begin to let go of this? I can worry about it, but I'm not able to do anything about it. So, and, and that's the question when that worry comes up then you say to yourself, can, can I begin to just let go of this a little bit? And, and that then that's a three-step process that I think can really be helpful. I often tell people that you can't unknow what you know. And I think that's one of the struggles for widowed people when it comes to worry is that suddenly the fact that people die is real and it's a part of your everyday life. And so the idea that we're gonna not be able to do something about many of our worries, you know, is legitimate in such, especially when you consider that, you know, we could start worrying and we do worry, but speaking from experience, you know, that everyone around us, all of our loved ones are gonna die. Suddenly you're concerned about whether people text you when they get home. It can become such a huge piece of your life worrying about what, might happen because of what has happened. So yes. to be able to sort of focus that energy really can be a helpful coping mechanism for what is now a part of your life and you're not going to unknow it. So it's something that will be a part of your life. So learning how to effectively manage it and give yourself some tools is such a valuable um, opportunity. Uh, Willis just sent us an email and he says, I, I lived happily for 26 years and we're blessed with three children, two boys and a younger girl. Um, I am currently live with my daughter who is nine year, was nine years old and the boys in college, I guess when his uh, wife died. He said, my problem is I've never forgotten my wife. Now, and the pain is deep rooted in my heart. Another problem is sympathy for having my children that they are motherless. I don't know how to handle it. We do have some um, suggestions in the book um, on, on that, you know, helping our kids and dealing with them. And that's a huge worry. You know, the, all, many of the people who contributed to the book said, boy, you want to put at the top of my list that I'm worried about? We're about my kids you know my sister's husband died when her when uh, their children were 21 and 25 that's still your children and you wonder how they're going to deal with the, you know with the death of their father and so on but again it's sitting down and saying to yourself are there some little things that i can do about this um and what can i do tomorrow that is going to maybe ease this just a little bit and 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 the whole idea of you know forgetting uh one spouse it's Finding little ways, and again, we mentioned that in the book, finding little ways to um, put together a picture album, you know, getting some videos together, um, you know, finding ways that you can remember. And so you don't have that worry, oh, my goodness, time is going by. I'm getting further away when this person was alive uh, and they feel distant. Well, the question then you ask yourself is what can I do to bring them closer? Well, and yeah. I think the other thing to remember is that they can be super specific. So if he's worried about, first of all, he's not going to ever forget his wife. So if he can give himself some solace in providing himself with one specific way, maybe, you know, going back to the candle, you know, maybe it's as simple as a time of day or a place or a week when he does something specific. But also in regards to your kids, you know, there's also specific steps that you can take to feel like you've made at least... Um, one small effort in being able to support them. We can't change what's happened. And again, you can't unknow what you know. So 
his kids are going to have to live with the death of their mom in the same way he's living with the death of his wife. But I feel if we are able to give ourselves the opportunity to take just small steps, it's amazing what one small step towards uh, feeling like you've done something positive in regards to one of your worries or something that, you know, like the well-being of your kids, which is an ongoing worry for many parents, even parents who aren't parenting grieving kids. Yeah. yeah. No, I absolutely agree. And one of the things I say um, to widow people who are concerned about their children is, you know what, um, this may be hard to get, but your kids are going to find ways to work through this. They're going to see a video. They're going to talk to somebody else. They're going to see something online. They're going to go to a movie. They're going to read a book. And in the cases of my students, they're going to go to college and they're going to see a class on grief and like, hmm. And so many of my students, they've experienced the death of a you know, a mother or father at a, at a young age, and um, they journal and find ways, as, as uh, we mentioned in the book as well, that find ways to deal with it. But you're right, Michelle, some little step that says, okay, well, I've done this. Now what else can I do? Mm -hmm. Oh, sleep. That was a big problem for me. Wow. It is hard. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, um, I put that in there because I, here's what I say to my students. I've been teaching psychology for more than 40 years. And the first 20 years or so, I talk about sleep, and you know, sleep is important. But psychology is really caught up with all this. And in the past 20 years, and I use this term, I have become a maniac on sleep. Uh, and for the listeners who are interested, if they want to email me, I'll give them a summary of a wonderful book, or if they want to buy the book, it's called Sleep for Success by James Moss, M A A S. And my, uh, my email is. You can look up my name and find my email, but it's B underscore K Bauer at yahoo.com. And I'll send you a one page, 28 point um, suggestions for how you can deal with sleep. Because, you know, I know Michelle knows this, is that um, your sleep gets disrupted. You're in grief uh, and you're used to sleeping next to someone. And for a moment, you forget that they're, that they're not there and you wake up, the, you know, all the things that go on with sleep. But I am, have been convinced over the years that one of the huge factors that contributes to a lot of the feelings of grief is that we're not getting the sleep that we need. The average person needs seven and a half to eight and a half hours sleep. And you hear people say, oh, I can get by on four or five. No, you can't, because during the course of the day, you end up um, having micro sleeps and your brain gets fuzzy and so on. And so um, I do want to just add to sleep that the other piece of it is that when we are so caught up in our emotional um, well-being and when the trauma of what we're experiencing through grief, whether it's early grief or the longer term dealing with life after you've you know made it through that first part and now are trying to cope with all the variety of things that life still has in store, um, is that we forget to take care of our physical bodies and sleep is a part of that. And so if you're feeling emotionally awful and on top of that, you're not taking care of your physical self, you're also feeling physically awful, which you may not recognize as a physical symptom because you're so caught up in the emotional piece. And so I like to remind people to drink water, to, to really work at that sleep, to make sure they're eating well. Um, they're easy things to fall right off your plate when you're so concerned about this huge emotional piece of your life. But if you can do your very best to give yourself the physical pieces, um, the things that your body needs to be able to be working as efficiently as possible, it will help you emotionally even though it may not seem like it's a priority early on. Um, and sleep is definitely oh, high. You're right. Of course. Well, um, problems continue, right? That's not, I mean, you have your first sleep issues and then you have, if you're worrying, if you're working two jobs now, if your kids are having to struggle with sleep, I mean, all of the things that will continue to interrupt your sleep can be long-term, which leads you to long-term sleep dep deprivation. And that can be really, really difficult. We've got another yeah. uh, a person who uh, has logged in and says, based on my own experience of my mother dying at age 40 when I was 13 in 1953, dads can listen to their kids. If a parent is open to the children, they will share their feelings and ideas and it'd be amazingly helpful. Little kids can be amazingly insightful and helpful, probably better than older kids. Let them share their grief. And I love that. You must have had an amazing dad. This is kind of an, uh, from an anonymous uh, text in. But um, yeah, dads can listen to their kids. That's a very sweet comment. 
Yeah, today I was talking about um, a lot of grief reactions, and every time I would talk about depression or anger, or guilt or whatever, and I would say to my students, and here's what you can do, and they go, we well, you know, listen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what about feelings and presence and dreams? Yeah, uh, years ago, uh, actually when I was first doing my dissertation, like 30 some years ago, I read some of the research and they, uh, and they uh, the research found that about half of all widowed people experience some sort of feelings of presence, especially during the first year. And, you know, you can put it into various categories. Visual, some people saw their loved one standing there for a few seconds or whatever, or, and it wasn't that they were, um, you know, just about ready to go to sleep and they had some visual hallucination. It was, I saw my husband standing there or I was in the kitchen and th there she was for a moment. And it's like, oh my goodness. And of course, you know, you feel like you're going crazy, right? And then there's the auditory part is that I, I heard him say my name, just as plain as, you know, and there was no one else around and it wasn't another sound. I just heard him, you know, say my name or, or touching. I, I felt him touch me on the arm and I, I couldn't believe it. it. And I knew it was him, right? And so for those of you, who are widowed and having, you know, those kinds of experiences, even, even smelling. I walked into this room and I thought I smelled, you know, his cologne. Those are normal experiences that people have. Now, if you haven't had it, you know, at some point you, you might, but if you have, you need to understand that about half of all widowed people report something like that. I do think I, that it's worth mentioning that, you know, that first of all, that does happen to a lot of widowed people. And it's equally true that it doesn't happen to some. I've talked to so many widowed people who have said, you know, my best friends, my best widowed friend, you know, has heard from her husband all the time. And my husband's been totally silent. What does that mean? Um, <laughs> and, you know, it can make you feel like, oh, wait, you know, does he not love me as much as my friend's husband loved her? Or my friend's partner, you know, is, it seems to be around all the time. So, you know, it is a, it's a really personal experience and it's so different for everyone. So, you know, try to give yourself a lot of grace around, you know, whatever your particular experience is, knowing first that it, it is very normal and also normal to have the other experience as well. Yeah. You know, good, my good. mother uh, told me what, what a sweet story. Uh, she t said, you know, your dad, I'd go to bed at night after he died and I felt like he was sleeping with me. And then she said, after a couple of weeks, one day I was laying there and I kind of heard him say, you're on your own now, girl. And, <laughs> <laughs> and she said, great. I never felt like he was there again. Yeah. <laughs> It's kind of sweet it wasn't you know i think people have those sweet feelings and they're wonderful things to embrace we've got another uh question here to all the panelists mary says lost my hus husband eight years ago and the pain never goes away it hurts all the time this is eight years ago any thoughts well you know mary i always tell people when they ask how long you're going to grieve that the answer generally is for as long as the person i'm grieving is dead so, you know, there's always some level of grief around the fact that the person that we want to spend our rest of our lives with is no longer on earth with us and sharing life in the way that they did. So in my mind, I feel that it's really normal for you to continue to miss him and for there to be all of these different places where his absence will make itself present. I'd also really encourage you to just keep trying to find ways to continue to build a life for yourself while you're here. It makes a huge difference to have a community. It also makes a huge difference to continue as hard as it can be to explore your own um, interests, your own, you know, things that start to fill your soul, whether that's volunteering or whether that's your work or whether that's your friends or whether that's your family. And if none of that is available to you at this point, to be able to start slowly to make some steps to continue to create a life that both is something that you love to live and also that honors the love you had for your person who you will always, always love and miss. Okay, Bob, as a psychologist coming in, it's been eight years. What are your thoughts? Well, I, I, yeah, I agree with Michelle that, you know, the pain is there and um, you're, you're, you're missing this person in all, in a, you know, a million different ways. And that I think for some people, they don't want to go to those places that, that give them pain. Maybe they don't want to go back to some place where they used to walk or enjoy or whatever. But, you know, in psychology, what we often say is, you know, at times try to lean into your pain, you know, listen to that song that you want to turn off because it, you know, because it reminds you of, of 
of him um, because listening to that song 50 times pretty soon, it's not going to carry the same emotionality that it, that it is. And I think for some people, of course, I don't know, you know, this situation, but for some people, it's like they want to hang on to the pain because it means that they're hanging on to their loved one's memory. And so part of, you know, our grief work is how can I still keep this person with me in my heart and in my mind and yet start to let go of some of that pain? Because when I let go of some of that pain, it doesn't mean that I'm letting go of my loved one. And that's where, you know, an organization like Soaring Spirits can offer, you know, information and talking to other people and feeling that pain and yet at the same time still keeping that person with you. That's such a good point, Bob, because you want, you know, it, that the line between holding on to grief because it feels familiar and because it yeah. feels connected to your person and the line at which you realize that the holding on to the pain, not the person, but the holding on to the pain is actually hurting you more. You know, so that's yeah. that it, it's so hard to figure out where that line is. And that's why building community and finding ways to sort of create a life for yourself begins to help you make that shift where you realize my person's never leaving my heart. My person's never leaving my life. It's a part of who I am, but I don't have to hold on to the pain to prove it to myself or anyone else. Yeah. You know, this, uh, yeah. we're coming to five and, uh, you know, that fifth point you made. And uh, I think some of these uh, five, six, and seven points that you made, Bob, are going to help answer questions about dealing with the pain. But I, uh, coming into this about being alone and loneliness, I wanted to read you this uh, question. It's from Paul. And he says, how do I go about meeting fellow widowers in my area or close by? At this point, I'm not interested in dating. I just would like to meet men friends. So it sounds like here's a guy who doesn't want to be alone in loneliness and realizes. Yeah. Michelle, you have a suggestion you know, on that? We do. We offer a, a pen pal program that would match him with another widower. So um, that would mean that wherever they are in the U.S. or in the world, they would have an opportunity to connect in that way. Another thing is there is the National Widowers Association, I think it's called, um, and they offer the opportunity to meet with other widowers. They are national, but I think they're pretty spread out. So it's not, I mean, it's possible certainly that there wouldn't be an in-person meeting in your area, but I would also highly recommend to anyone, go to any of your local hospices. If you're specifically looking for other widowed people and say, I'm looking for another widowed person, widower, in his case, he's looking for another widower who might be interested in talking to him. Because while not everyone maybe goes to support groups, it is certainly possible that they would know of another widower who was also looking for someone to connect with and have lunch or go golf or do whatever it is they would want to do to connect. So. The more you the more you reach out, the more likely it is you're going to be able to find somebody. Um, Soaring Spirits is certainly a place to start, and any of those other options, especially if you're looking particularly for an in-person group, because that can vary widely based on where you live. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at there's a website called um, widowerssupportnetwork.com, and that can be a, a you know go, uh, find that website, and that that can be a great place to start. Yeah. So what about being alone and loneliness, Bob? Well, um, you know, here's one person who, who said we have it in the book. For most of us, loneliness is just not a struggle. It's a huge problem. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, coming home to an empty house, um, contacting other people, uh, you know, sleeping in an, in an empty bed, uh, you know, uh, and so we, you know, some suggestions and uh, some people said that they got a pet, you know, for my sister, uh, a few months afterwards, she, um, uh, her a daughter got her a, a little dog, uh, Shih Tzu, and uh, now she comes home and this little dog is jumping up and down and is so happy to see her. I, I always say, you know, if humans greeted other humans like, like animals do, especially dogs, your cat doesn't care much, right? But, you know, then this world would be such a better place. Like, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. How you doing? Right? And, and so, and then uh, reaching out and asking others, sometimes we're a little afraid because we are now single and we got our married friends, but, you know, taking that risk to say, you know, in a month, I'm think, thinking about going to this place with, you know, would, you know, would you like to go with me? And, um, and then also accept invitations for some people they kind of shut down and they don't want to go out because uh, I, I'm so uncomfortable, but being able to say, 
a yes to those invitations that other people are asking. And, and let me add one, one more thing. And that even consider driving yourself um, rather than going with someone because after a half hour, you may not want to be there anymore. This is what a lot of widowed people have said. And your friend who took you now wants to stay there for two hours. So, or take Uber or, or a taxi or something so that you can have the control of, you know, you're not ready to stay very long and you want to go home. I know one of the things that people tell me that have lost kids, you know, uh, pregnancies and things is seeing pregnant women just absolutely freaks them out or sometimes seeing uh, people with kids or whatever. So it's the same thing, seeing couples interact, what you had or what you thought you had, it's tough, huh? Yeah, let, let me, I'm going to read something and then uh, I want to hear Michelle. Um, here's what someone said. I'd be walking down the street or strolling through the mall and there in front of me is a couple walking hand in hand at a leisurely pace, content, not a care except for the errand they may be on at the moment. Or in a restaurant, the couple at the next table enjoying a meal together, enjoying conversation together, sharing the day's news or interest together. I, I, I want to say to them, don't you know how lucky you are? You are together. Mm. So Michelle, you want to? Yeah, I mean... Or I've heard other widow people say, I just want to punch you in the face because I'm so <laughs> jealous. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, the thing about it is this, you know, you're looking at what you wished you were going to have for a longer time than you did, however long it was. And this is so true no matter how long you were with your spouse or partner. So, you know, whether it was three weeks, not long enough, whether it was five years or 56 or 75, it always feels like not enough time. And so seeing other people in having what you hoped you would have is, it can be really hard. And to be jealous is totally normal. Don't punch anyone in the face. That's not nice. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, I also want to say, remember, you're, you're also kind of making assumptions. It's easy to do. But um, I witnessed a couple walking and, um, and looked over and thought to myself, you know, I don't know that those aren't two widowed people that found each other late in life having both experienced a huge trauma and now they're here together enjoying, you know, what time they have together. I think maybe they've been married 75 years, but you know what? They might not be married at all, or they might be married three weeks. So it's easy to assume that everyone has it way better than you, but it's possible that that's just your assumption. And so yeah. to be able to keep that in your mind, because it's so easy to create the dream, right? And to think that every commercial, you know, you see the commercials where they're all getting diamonds. You know, not everybody is gifted with the diamonds. <laughs> so, you know, you remember that there's a painted picture that we sometimes buy into when the reality may be very different. And what we're missing is the opportunity that we didn't have. And that is so normal. And it does get better with time. But it's like that thing that pokes you, you know, out of the blue. It might always hurt just a little bit to look at someone and think, what would we have been like if we'd been able to be together for that long? Chris just uh, emailed in and said, my wife passed away four years ago. I have two children, and I find it difficult to help them during Mother's Day. Any suggestions? Oh, I think that it's the, one of the hardest days, Mother's Day, Father's Day, like the thing that you can't give your kid is for them to be here. The best thing I can say is that just because your mom or dad is dead does not mean you don't have one. It doesn't mean that you don't get to celebrate them on that day in whatever way makes sense for your family. And so whether, you know, you go away completely and don't think about the day or whether you share write her a letter, write him a letter, whether it's, um, you know, as an example, my late husband um, is from Mexico and he, and so on the anniversary of his death, we would always go and have Mexican dinner. That's what we did. And we would share memories of him. So maybe on Mother's Day, you go to the favorite restaurant or you cook the favorite food. It's just that idea that you, you get to have it. You don't have to not have it because they're not alive. You can celebrate them. You can honor them as a mother or as a father and be able to continue being grateful that they're that person for you, whether or not they're alive and present physically in order to celebrate with you. I, I think it's important also, Bob, and it is to normalize it. I mean, we're talking about any kind of loss. You're going to have that anniversary thing, right? Yes, absolutely. And and for many people, it, it, it's sometimes harder for the day's 
week going up to it, you know, so, um, you know, Mother's Day is the second day in May, so now it's April, and it's like, oh, no, and, you know, the, the weather's the same, and, you know, and it just reminds you of last year, mom was here, or, or here's another Mother's Day without her, and so on, and so this anticipation, but I agree with Michelle, and, and deciding ahead of time, you know, deciding weeks ahead of time, whether it's their birthday, or the anniversary, or mom, or dad's day, and saying, here's my plan ahead of time, this is what I'm going to do, so you don't keep fretting about, what am I going to do on this day, it's like, this is what we're going to do, and, you know, let's see if we can make it happen. Also, on that note, too, for kids with school, uh, we've had we've talked a lot about this at our Camp Widow event specifically, but you know if your kid needs to take a mental health day on the day that you're supposed to be making the Mother's Day craft or the Father's Day craft, that's totally okay. <laughs> you know because they're walking into a room full of other kids who are making it for their particular person. So you can do lots of things. You can say, okay, who would you like to make it for in advance so that they have a sense of, oh, I'm going to make this for Uncle Jim who I love so much. So I'm now making it for Uncle Jim, it's Father's Day. Or you can say, you know what? We don't have to do that that day. So that's not necessarily something you have. I feel like sometimes we, we feel required to torture ourselves um, when we really don't have to. Yeah, yeah, excellent. So uh, Bob, what about unmarried friends? What did you, uh, people comment about that being around married friends I mean and feeling like a fifth wheel wow that's a big yeah. one I always I always hear women say that they feel like a bit they're a bit dished because their old friends are afraid they might be hitting on their husbands yep I I call it you know I call it the hungry widow or the hungry widower so I actually I'm going to lecture on this next week uh, as we finish up my class on death and life and here's I said picture this scenario Here's a woman, her husband died six months ago, and she's been invited to the office party. And um, so she's kind of reluctant, but she goes, I'm going to go, you know, maybe see some of the people who knew my husband, Harold, you know. So here she walks into the party and everyone's walking around and, you know, talking, but they don't notice her. And so she's at the punch bowl ready to, you know, get some punch. And all of a sudden she hears, hello, hello, Sally, how you doing? And she looks up and there's one of Harold's coworkers. Oh, hi, George. How are you? Oh, fine. And they start chatting. You know, I really miss your husband and so on. And now on the other side of the room is George's wife. George's wife is looking for George. Where's George? Oh, he's over there. Who is he? Oh, wait a minute. He's talking to Sally. Uh, uh, and she walks up. Oh, uh, nice seeing you, Sally. Come along, George. Right. And she's standing there like, what was that about? You know, that somehow, you know, wait a minute. She thinks I want, right? And so this craziness that happens when that wasn't your intent at all. And suddenly you're, you're in the midst of, you know, they think you, you want their husband. Yeah, you'd think that doesn't happen, but it really does. <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing, too, is that, you know, whether you're the third wheel or the fifth wheel or the seventh wheel, um, you know, even around well-meaning friends, there is an energy that exists between couples. And so, you know, you find yourself outside the energy, even with people who mean really well. And so I just always advise widowed people to do what's best for you today. So my dear, dear friends, after my husband died, I, you know, were very comforting to me. So the three of us would hang out together and I felt fine, but there were definitely days where I was like, you know what, I don't want to be the third wheel today. And so do as much or a little of that as feels right for you while maintaining relationships that are important to you, um, but only if they're positive and only if they are able to not treat you like, you know, you'd be afraid that their, your husband or wife is no longer safe or your partner is no longer safe with you. The things that happened to me years ago, actually not to me, but to a good friend of mine, she was one of the last of our friends back when we were in our 20s to get married. She married this man. He was 33. Um, nine months later, she's a widow at 29 years old. And so she came over and would have dinner with us and so on, and we're supporting her. But there were times where my wife and I would bicker with one another like couples do. And I would glance over and I could see our friends sitting there wanting to jump in between us, wanting to say, what are you doing? You know, I'd give anything to be talking to my husband that right now, but you're, you're mad at her? Like, stop, stop it, right? Michelle, anything oh, about yeah, that you want to? Sure. I mean, and it's worse, like at restaurants, when you hear people speaking to each other, 
you know, in a really ugly way or something. And you just think what I would give for the opportunity to have five more minutes. And I feel you're absolutely wasting them. Um, but what I, I think that this gets filed under the category of one of the gifts of grief is that we have new eyes and we see relationships and we see opportunities to love people in a totally different way because we realize that we don't have as much time as we might think. And so while that is initially annoying, I think that it does actually lead to more uh, opportunity for deep relationships, more recognition that the time we have with the people we love is really our most valuable gift. Which I think fits into all types of losses. Michelle, I wanted to ask you, what did you do with your ring? Well, right here is Phil's wing. Um, I, uh, I didn't know what to do with it initially. And, to, and actually I was at, imagine going to the nail salon like eight weeks after my husband died, my nails are a wreck and I'm like, I'm just gonna go get my nails done. That's what I'm gonna do. And I sit down in the chair and she looks at my hand and she sees my wedding ring and she says to me, wait, isn't your husband dead? <gasps> right? I was like, if I hadn't had my hands in already and I couldn't get up, I would have been running right out the door. And so, it made me realize like, okay, how many of these kind of interactions do I want to have? And I struggled and struggled with what was the right thing. And then I thought, you know, my promise to him ended with his death, right? I don't have an opportunity to continue to be his wife, but his promise to me did not end with his death because he's not going to get married. Well, at least not that I know of wherever he is. <laughs> um, and so I decided to size his wedding ring, which is what I wear on my right hand now. And it's become just a part of a recognition of the love that we share and how important he was in my life and continues to be as I grow through, um, you know, the experience of living without him. Wow. Yeah, that's what I um, had people tell me um, is that there's no rule, right? Mm -hmm. Some people wear it till the day they die. He put it on my finger. I'm yep. not getting married again. It's right here. Yep. Other people, I'm going to put it on my other fingers. Others are going to wear it around their neck. For yep. some people, it's like, well, I, you know, I, I don't want to take it off because I don't want people to think that I'm not married. Yep. But, but maybe I could date again. No, I can't date. That's ridiculous. What am I thinking? Right? And so all this. And some people take it off. Goes on on and put it on and off <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like yeah you try it exactly out. No, that's not, yeah. not time yet yeah. that must be a hard a hard moment uh we've just got a, a question here or a statement would you please deal with unfinished business that i had with my partner before they died i don't don't feel like i'd finished business yeah bob do you want to go well first? okay <laughs> well number one here here comes you need to write it I okay. was just gonna say, need to write down. Michelle's writing. nodding her head. Yeah, yeah. those those Gloria. Um, yeah. you, you need to write it out. What is my unfinished business? And then, if you have unfinished business with this person, you write a letter, and you say, "Here are the things I wish I said. Here are the things that I wanted to do. Here," and you get it out and you get it down on paper. Now, some people say, and then you burn it. I, I, I'm not into that. Maybe make a copy and burn burn the original or whatever. But I think you need to date it. You know, sign it. Um, and then put it someplace where you're going to see it later, where you come across it a month or two or a year later and go, this was my, this is what I thought back then on, you know, March 7th, 2018, but now I'm shifting a little bit, but you need to get it out on paper. Also so, realize that it might not just be one time. You know, I no, think so often right. we feel like, okay, well, if I write it down, well, then what's that going to do? But if you keep writing it down and keep writing it down until you feel like there's nothing else to write. Like that's, that's the point at which you say, okay, I've dealt with this business. So it may be for some people that they can get it all down in one and, and be able to read it a year later and feel like, yeah, I really did come through something with that. And other times maybe the unfinished business is such that you need to take it in pieces. Maybe you need to just take one piece and write a letter about that. And then another piece and write a letter about that. But it really does give you an opportunity to not be carrying that. And a lot of times that unfinished business that we carry is what pulls us down into those darker feelings, is what continues to help us feel like we have to hold on to the pain in order to hold on to the person. So being able to kind of get through that bit by bit can really make a difference, not maybe right away, but in the long term for sure.
one of the things I had a widowed man write me. He he was one of the contributors to the book, um, and he said, "When my wife died." I suddenly realized all the things she did. <laughs> and now I'm looking up, you know, kind of, I'm not angrily, but kind of shaking my fist like, thanks a lot. You know, why don't you get back down here and tell me how, the, how you did all this stuff. And so that's part of it is that, you know, they did stuff that you don't know how to do. And so the question becomes, what little things can you do to start to organize the paperwork, you know, the bills, the sympathy cards, I'm just reading this funeral information. Uh, how do you, contact with immediate family and in-laws, the obituary, social security, medical information, things to buy, things to do later, calls to make legal matters. I, I know widowed people are nodding their head like, yep, yep, that's, that's what it is. Michelle? Get help. That's what I say. <laughs> Get help. Because the thing is, it's overwhelming. And sometimes the overwhelming, overwhelmed feeling keeps you from doing anything, right? So we can be sort of stuck. And sometimes that stuckness can lead to consequences that will ultimately make your life more complicated instead of less. And so if you're looking at a huge pile of paper and you're thinking, I, I don't even know where to start, then call your friend, call your, your neighbor, call your someone you trust, someone you feel like would help you, and just sit down together and start sorting. It, you don't have to do it all by yourself. And when you listen to Bob you know, going through that whole list and it's like, oh, it gives me a headache just thinking about it. It, one of the things we always say in um, the Soaring Spirits provides newly widowed packets that are free. You can request them through the mail. Um, uh, they come to you through the mail. So you request them on our website. Inside that packet is a checklist. And the checklist goes through a number of things you may want to consider in those first six months. And I think like item number one or two is get help. <laughs> Find somebody <laughs> who's willing to help you go through this because it's already overwhelming it might be an overwhelming pile of work for someone who's not grieving. Add to that that you're also grieving and it can seem impossible, but bit by bit, taken chunk by chunk with a good friend and, you know, somebody who you feel like you can allow into that space um, really can make a huge difference to your ability to, to cope with what's left. Let's think about some tips for people about taking care of themselves. And what did you hear from people, Bob, about taking care of themselves? Well, some of the things that Michelle said already, you know, um, I, I got some things from the book here, you know, taking care of your body, journaling, changing your environment, uh, finding a hobby, doing reading. Of course, a lot of that can't happen right away, but I, I really want to go back to taking care of your body. You know, um, we know that uh, your brain takes up about 30% of all of the energy that you use each day. And of course, probably even more when you're grieving. And so you got to do, like Michelle says, anything you can. And, you know, you hear people say, oh, don't eat junk food and all that. For me, it's like, okay, go ahead and eat some junk food. But make sure you're getting, you know, three, four, five fruits and vegetables each day and, you know, doing those little things that you know are good for your diet. For some people, they don't, you know, they, they can't, they don't want to cook for one person and so they end up, you know, but it begins in the grocery store. What little things can you buy that are going to help you be healthy? And then, of course, we talked about the, about the sleep stuff as well. Journaling is another one. My friend, who I told you years ago, it, you know, her husband died when she was 29. One of the things I said to her is, you know, you might think about journaling. And uh, we talked, you know, weeks later and she goes, no, I'm, I'm not ready yet. Not ready yet. Two years later, she calls and leaves a message years ago on my answer machine. And I could tell she'd been crying. She goes, well, Bauer, are you happy now? Huh? I, I started, you know, two years it took her, but she started to get those feelings out, get it on paper. And, you know, it started to feel a little better. And then changing your environment, you don't know? don't let people pressure you to start, you know, revamping your whole house. You decide when you want to change your environment, and doesn't mean you're forgetting your loved one if you want to, you know, do something different. I got more here, but Michelle, you want to jump in? Well, I've got three quick things. Um, one is I always tell people be as kind to yourself as you would be to your best friend in your exact same circumstance because we can be so hard on ourselves and expect the world when our whole world has just been turned upside down. So my first bit of advice is always in taking care of yourself is to be kind to yourself. Secondly, um, on the note of journaling, some people find it difficult to figure out what will they even write. One thing that worked for me is that I wrote a letter to my husband every day 
Um, and at the end of the day, so, you know, I had taken care of all my responsibilities. The kids were in bed. I was finally alone yet again in my room. And it was a way for me to feel like I was still communicating my day, still feel like I had a connection to him, but also, of course, getting out the feelings of the day. So it was a way of sort of directing my writing personally that helped. Um, and then lastly, I can't express strongly enough how important it is to have a community, a widowed community specifically, because when you are around other widowed people, whether it's online or in person, um, I wanted, I do want to add the piece, make sure it's a positive widowed community. It's a widowed community whose purpose is to help move forward and who are really focused on being supportive of each other and kind to each other. But if in finding a community like that, you, you start to get all of these different suggestions and ways that other people have helped themselves. And, you know, so if you're eating junk food this week and you haven't been able to eat anything else, you know, forgive yourself. And next week, you know, maybe you'll find somebody who says, hey, I got this great app on my phone for grocery shopping and it made it so much easier. So stay connected to a community of people who will help you because the way forward is always through the pain, right? We can't really, we can't go around it. We do have to go through it, but we don't have to go through it alone. Well, thank you, yeah. Michelle and Bob, for being on the show. And Bob, you need to get Bob's book, Surviving Widowhood, Suggestions for Widowed People to You, for Coping with the Death of Your Husband, Wife, or Partner. So Bob, thank you so much for being on the show today. And Michelle, thanks for co-hosting. Oh, it was wonderful. We'll have to get together again, you guys. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> And thanks everybody for watching. Good night, everyone. Thanks everybody for watching the show. And we want to remind you always from Open to Hope, and I'm sure from Bob and Michelle, if you've lost hope, please lean on ours until you find your own. And God bless.